I invite you to take a Bible, if you will, and open it with me to the very beginning. Back to Genesis chapter 2, where we will be reading together in just a few moments. If you didn't bring a Bible, hopefully there is one very close to you, beneath the row of chairs in front of you. And this is an easy passage in God's Word to find. It is right there in the very beginning where we will be reading together from Genesis chapter 2. Thank you so much for being here this evening. We have been blessed in so many different ways. This weekend, throughout the past week, we are anticipating future blessings and our Holy Father that we have sung about this evening as infinitely holy and high above us, worthy of all of our praises. He is the fountain of all these great blessings. And it is so very appropriate that we would focus our hearts on Him this morning. We are talking throughout 2015 in a variety of different ways here within the context of our local family about victory about having a victorious mindset, about living in the light of victory that has been secured by Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We have sought throughout this year to grow in our appreciation of the victory that He has won so that if we are in Him, we also can share in that victory. I hope that you see the story of Jesus is more than simply an ancient tale of something that happened a very long time ago, but that it is an historical account of what God's own Son accomplished on the cross of Calvary, in His resurrection from the dead, that changes everything. It has changed everything. It is the hinge of history. It is what we find as His followers, our new identity in. Because He has won victory over sin, over death, or over Every foe, if we are in Him, that redefines everything about who we are and what we are about and how we approach this life, our time, very, very briefly on this earth. And so we have sought over the course of the last several months on various occasions to go back to look at the foundations of everything so that even our individual identities are framed or reframed as Christians, as redeemed sons and daughters of God in the light of this victory. We have spent time in talking about what it means to be male as created in the image of God. What does it mean to be female as created in the image of God? And how does the victory of Christ define that for us. We have spent time in talking about victorious marriages. What does it mean to be victorious husbands and victorious wives? In so many different aspects of everyday identity, the victory of Jesus is absolutely key. And this morning what we do is focus the light of the victory of Jesus on parenthood. What does it mean to be victorious as disciples of Jesus Christ who are also parents during our very brief time on this earth? I begin with just some very basic foundational truths that will hopefully give us very solid ground on which to build everything else that we talk about this morning. Number one, Parenthood was God's idea. And let's not take that for granted this morning. There are so many different ways. We see in the wonder of the natural creation around us, so many different ways that God could use to propagate the human race, to, to populate the whole earth, and to have humanity spread 
all over the globe. We could have people just spontaneously appearing out of nowhere without any human context or connection. God could produce people from rocks. God could produce people from water. He could do it in any number of different ways. He could produce people from people without any real tie. The sword of tie that we have sung about this morning. The sword of tie that gets down into our heart level and shapes and reshapes so many different aspects of who we are as men and women. But God didn't choose to do it that way. God chose parent. You have your Bible open there to Genesis chapter 2. Begin reading with me in the 21st verse of the chapter where God has clearly communicated that it is not good that Adam, the first man, would be alone. And so in verse 21, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then I want you to notice this great summary statement in verse 24. A God-breathed summary where he says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother. There it is. I don't know about you, but oftentimes when I'm reading Genesis 2, 24, I read it within the context of the man and the woman who are going to be joined together and the nature of their relationship. We've talked a great deal about marriage from this most foundational of texts. But notice with me, before there is ever a physical father and a physical mother, that God Almighty uses those words. An aspect of what it will mean for so many to be human. Created in the image of God with great blessing and great responsibility. A man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. In the next chapter, you turn to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 20 where we are told that Adam, this man, called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Parenthood was God's idea. Finally, in Genesis chapter 4, we see this coming to fruition. God has already described what this is even before it happens, even before it is enjoyed. In Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1, we are told that Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. The mother of all living conceived and bore a son named Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. It's hard for us to imagine what that must have been like, right? To have Adam and to have Eve and then suddenly to have another human being on the earth a fellow image bearer of God that God has seen fit by His design to bring into the world via a man and a woman. It is no wonder that Eve would say, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Why? Because parenthood was God's idea. 
That's the beginning of the Old Testament. Would you open your Bible with me back to the first book in the New Testament, back to the Gospel of Matthew chapter five, where we have already had the the table set for us by Nathan. I appreciate him framing where we were going to be and why he selected the songs that he sang. Yes, God Almighty, physical parenthood was his idea. But how amazing. Would you gaze with me this morning at this incredible truth that God not only creates man and woman in His image and then by His design empowers them to have children so that Adam might be father and Eve might be mother and on and on and on. That chain of humanity goes down through the ages How much more amazing that the Son of God now in Matthew chapter 5 steps on the scene and in His first most monumental and formative of messages talks about this Creator God and I want you to notice the way that He describes Him. First of all, in Matthew 5 and verse 14, as Jesus looks at his disciples, he says, you, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, you let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. I plead with you this morning not just to read over that, but to meditate and to marvel with me how incredible that the most formative human being ever to walk the face of the earth who shows with abundant evidence yes I came into this world I came to be among you as a human being I have an earthly mother Mary But my Father is in heaven. And now as He speaks to those who are willing to follow Him and give their lives to Him, He not only talks about His Father, He not only talks about the Creator, but He talks about your Father who is in heaven. And to drive that point, He does it over and over and over again. Later in the same chapter, verses 44 and 45, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For He, our Father in heaven, makes His Son rise on the evil and on the good. Our Father in heaven sends rain on the just and on the unjust. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 3, He says, "You, When you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret and your Father, who sees in secret, He will reward you. How incredible. Would you slow the pace of your life down and and, and deliberately focus your spirit this week? How incredible that God Almighty sends His Son And His Son teaches His disciples to pray, Our Father in Heaven. One thing to be Creator. One thing to be Sovereign Lord over all. Another thing to be Father. 
parenthood was God's idea. Open your Bible with me to the center of your Bibles, back to Psalm 127. And would you notice with me now, having established the fact that this was God's idea, how very valuable any time He would speak to the way He wants us to conduct ourselves as fathers and mothers. He is the designer. He is the architect. He is the empowerer. And so anytime he would speak to humanity about what we would do, what he wants us to be as physical fathers and mothers, that is priceless. In Psalm 127 and verse 3, we find that children are a heritage from the Lord. Psalm 127 and verse 3. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb, a reward. How important is it that we would listen to the designer, the architect of parenthood? That comes through loud and clear in verse 1. Unless the great I am builds the house, those who build it, they labor in vain. Would you come face to face with me this morning to this great truth? You don't have to believe in God in order to be able to physically reproduce. That doesn't nullify the fact that this was God's idea all along. That children are a heritage from Him and that unless we listen to Him, we are missing the point. Not looking to what this was all about from the very beginning. And whatever we build in the grand scheme of things, it's vain. Raise a Rhodes Scholar who never comes to believe in God and that Rhodes Scholar has missed the point of all knowledge and wisdom. Raise the most famous influential engineer who is able to get us to the farthest planet. And that engineer doesn't come to believe in God and all of those explorations are really in vain. Raise the most beautiful sought after physically admired daughter in the history of humanity and she doesn't believe in God and give herself to him hide herself in his refuge and she doesn't have the most profound beauty the beauty of the inward spirit she's missed the point of it all and so you open your Bibles with me back to the Old Testament book of Joshua. For the remainder of our time, what I would like to do with you is notice just very briefly five points. What victorious parents do. What victorious parents believe. All from the Bible. All is defined by the one of whom parenthood began. It was his idea. Victorious parents, number one, they love and they serve the only perfect father. They come to grips with the fact that they themselves are not. I stand before you this morning absolutely, deeply flawed. Far from perfect. I've got one grown, three smaller witnesses to that fact who live with me each and every day. You are not a perfect father or a perfect mother. And in order to gain the victory in Jesus Christ, in order to be His and, and discover why you are here and make the most of your time on this earth, you don't have to be the perfect earthly father or mother, but you do need to love and serve the only 
perfect Father in heaven. Is that not what Joshua is seeking to lead God's people to in Joshua chapter 24? It is what he, by his own declaration, is intent on leading his family towards. In Joshua 24 and verse 14, he challenges the descendants of Abraham. Now therefore fear the Lord. Serve Him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Joshua understands. He wants these people to understand. It does not matter what we are able to conquer. What cities we are able to capture. It doesn't matter the walls that we are able to build. If we do not fear the Lord. And serve Him in sincerity and in faithfulness. It will not last. And everything that we have built will have been in vain. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, make a choice. Choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your fathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Here is the basis, the very cornerstone of victorious parenthood. Victorious parents love and serve the only perfect father because he is aware, she is aware, earthly fathers and mothers are keenly aware. We make so many mistakes. There are so many things we wish we could go back and undo. That There are so many opportunities that we had that we wish we could go back and take full advantage of. But guess what? Everything does not depend upon us. It does depend upon the Father of Spirits. This morning, your spirit has a father. A spirit that you did not get from your earthly father. A spirit that comes from your heavenly father. Victorious parents, number one, love and serve that only perfect father. Go with me to the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 11, victorious parents, number one, live a life worth imitating. Victorious parents live a life worth imitating. Yes, keenly aware that they are not perfect, that their children have seen them make mistakes. Victorious parents are willing to own those mistakes. Not to seek to blame someone else for those mistakes. That's what I did. I was wrong. Victorious parents are willing to ask for forgiveness from God and from the people around them. But the trajectory of their life is a life worth imitating. Saul of Tarsus, now the Apostle Paul, knew what it was with every fiber of his being to want to go back and undo so many different things that he had done. To confess his belief in Jesus while Jesus was still literally physically walking among people. He couldn't go back and do that. And yet he had been forgiven. He had been reconciled to God because of the victory of Jesus over sin and death. Now the Apostle Paul is able to share in that victory. And he is able to write in full unhypocritical confidence to brothers and sisters in Corinth. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Parents, could I say fearfully, humbly, our children can get over a lot of things. They can forgive a lot of things. They can leave a lot of things in, in the past. 
But one thing that will absolutely stick with them and leave a scar is hypocrisy on the part of their father, the part of their mother. Seeing mom and dad put on one very clean, dignified mask on Sunday morning and then take that mask off and live a completely different life Monday through Saturday. Victorious parents live a life worth imitating. Listen, by God's design, children are imitators. It's one of the things that fascinate the newest of parents and then come to exasperate parents given enough time. Children are imitators, right? They are little sponges and they soak in and they soak in and they soak in and give them the right time and opportunity, what they have soaked in begins to come out all over the place in the most opportune and inopportune of moments. Children are imitators. And you are teaching them how to talk, how to treat others, how to work, how to sacrifice. Husbands, you're teaching how wives are to be treated. Wives, you are teaching how husbands are to be treated. We are teaching children, even this morning, all of us, how to worship, how to sing, how to pray, how to focus on God's Word. We are teaching how to go without, how to deny ourselves, how to deal with frustrations and with disappointments. Victorious parents live a life worth imitating. Go with me to the Old Testament book of 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles 28 to the historical moment here where David, Israel's greatest king, his life is coming to an end. And we find that victorious parents, number three, invest in eternity. We know what it is to invest, don't we? We deposit maybe very small amounts, but we are making deposits, looking to the future. We're consistently making deposits. We're, we're patiently making deposits. And we realize sometimes we gain and sometimes we lose, but we keep making those deposits. That is what it means to invest. Victorious parents invest in eternity. Great King David, now a very old man, as he looks at Solomon, who is about to take over the throne of Israel. Listen to David's words in verse 9. You, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind, for the Lord searches all all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek Him, He will be found by you. But if you forsake Him, He will cast you off forever. Of all the things, this is the most important. David undoubtedly needs to talk to Solomon about economy and he needs to talk about defense and he needs to talk about advancing Israel's interests and he needs to talk about diplomacy and, and dangers within and dangers without and so many other things. But here is the foundation of everything. Solomon, whatever you do, invest in eternity. You now have to decide whom you will serve. Number four, go back with me to the book of Proverbs chapter 22. Victorious parents, they discipline their children. Listen to the admonitions, the encouragements, the commandments, the, the wisdom from the designer definer, empowerer of parenthood. 
Wisdom in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6 gives us this maxim. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And we understand that that is a wise statement. And the book of Proverbs is full of wise statements that are not divine promises as much as they are signposts. This is the wise pathway to choose. We've already established the fact. Children will make the choice on their own, in and of themselves, whom they are going to serve. But I want you to notice the first word that wisdom, by inspiration of the Spirit of God, chooses. Train. That's my responsibility. That's not any Bible class teacher's responsibility here. That's not any federal or local or state government's responsibility. That's my responsibility. Train. Specifically to fathers in Ephesians 6 and verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up. Fathers, you may go tomorrow, 8 to 5 or 9 to 5, and have a very important, very stressful job, full of responsibilities. But listen to me, it is not nearly as eternally significant as your responsibility when you open the door and walk in amongst your God-given family. Do not provoke your children to anger, fathers, but you Bring them up. How? According to the one who conceived of parenthood in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Teach them what is right. Teach them what is wrong. And hold them accountable, God says. Train them. In the wisdom of Proverbs 29 and verse 15, the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself, a child without this God-designed instruction, discipline mechanism of authority over them, a child left to himself or herself brings shame to his mother. Whose responsibility is it that my children would gain a heart of wisdom and be told, no, yes, you're not going to do that. Yes, you are going to do that. No, you have to wait. No, the world doesn't revolve around you. There are consequences for your actions. This is what it means to be reverent. This is what it means to be rewarded for doing what is good. That's my responsibility. That's your responsibility if you're a parent. The rod and reproof give wisdom. Listen to the designer of parenthood. A child left to himself brings shame to his mother. And so in Hebrews 12, in verse 5, Christians are addressed. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? Here is God Almighty, the Father of our spirits, talking to us. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by Him. For the Lord disciplines the one He loves. Will my children not only see that in Scripture, will they see that modeled in their father and in their mother? The father of spirits chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. Listen, discipline. God is treating you as sons. What does it say about my approach to fatherhood? If my children aren't learning that at home. What son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Do we believe God? 
that we wouldn't just wring our hands as to why our children don't seem to respect us, but that we would discipline them so that they would respect us. That's God's idea. And He works. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? They, our earthly fathers, disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. He disciplines us for our good. What's the point of discipline? That we and they may share His holiness. Is it difficult? It's one of the most difficult things we will ever do. And it's painful. But it does yield by God's design the peaceful fruit of righteousness. You remember where we began? Training. Discipline yields fruit, the fruit of righteousness by those who have been trained by it. Victorious parents discipline their children. Finally, number five. Open your Bibles with me back to Ephesians 5 where we will end in just a moment. Victorious parents realize that time moves so very quickly. You've heard it before. You've heard it from so many Here's my tossing my two cents into the fountain. I cannot believe that I am the father of a 14-year-old daughter. Can't believe it. It has gone so quickly. And how I encourage those of you who are holding 14-month-old sons and daughters realize it goes so quickly. The window shuts so quickly. And so victorious parents, they pray, Lord, make me know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. You have made my days a few handbreadths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. Victorious parents, they listen. When James in James chapter 4 encourages, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. And so victorious parents listen to the wisdom of Ephesians 5 and they apply it personally. In Ephesians 5 and verse 15, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise. Victorious parents, they love and they serve the only perfect Father. They live a life worth imitating. They invest in eternity. They discipline their children. And they realize that time is a quickly fleeting vapor. And so they, they begin to walk very carefully. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time. Because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish. The Father of our spirits says, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Each one of us, regardless of our family tree, are choosing, we're making a choice even this day, whom we will serve. We encourage you this morning, because we love you, to ask, whose will are you walking in? Are you walking in the will of of the Father of your spirits. And it's things like this that, that keenly reveal in our hearts how desperately we need forgiveness and grace and mercy. And there is good news this morning. The blood of Jesus Christ can wash those sins away. Each and every one of them. Regardless of what you have done, you can walk out of here forgiven reconciled to the Father of your spirit because of Jesus and His death on the cross. When people heard of His death and they were willing to ask what they needed to do, 
They were told to repent, to turn away from sin and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of those sins. And when they listened, they could go on their way rejoicing because they had come back to the Father of their spirits. Do you need to do that even this morning? If we can be of some help, would you let us know how by coming to the front while we stand and sing?